Hello everybody, my name is Ian Kirk Pettycake. I am an author and robot and today we're going to be talking about the very popular, very mainstream, I don't know if it's controversial book, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. Now a couple weeks ago I read this book and I've been sitting kind of thinking and processing how I wanted to talk about this book, how to share with you the experiences I had with it, the ideas that I found, and how best to summarize it in the fairest way of characterization as possible. Because the topic is race, you know that it's going to be very sensitive, specifically because I'm the color of a ghost. In thinking about presentation, I realized that I can't. I can't fairly characterize this book for you in its entirety and its ideas, so instead I'm going to read you some select passages I found very interesting to learning about what Ibram X. Kendi's perspective is, his beliefs are, what his experiences have been, and then I would love to hear what your responses are to the content in the comments down below. But before we get started, there are a couple things to say. Number one, my new book, Dead and Drive, debut novel, is now available. You can find it in the description down below from all of your favorite booksellers. Number two, we, there is one more week left for the November story prompt, Join Lemoy, the paddy wagon as I like to call it. That link is down in the description below. And third thing is, there is now merch if you're interested in that. That is also in the links down below. Now, on with the topic. I do want to preface the book and the content with do not take whatever you hear being read as a statement of myself or a statement of fact. Take any historical or nonfiction references and look at them up in detail for yourself. Ibram Kendi doesn't speak for fact necessarily, but he does speak from his perspective or what he thinks, sees, or feels. And that's what we're about to dive into. What somebody thinks or feels is not necessarily the truth. And then when you're in this sort of situation where you are making money from certain things, creating a certain perspective can be um, financially beneficial. So take whatever you hear and hear. If, if something seems fishy or something is like, oh, I've never heard of that before, look it up yourself. And I suggest doing this with any content creator or any documentary or anything that you see that is making references to history to check up on it yourself. Just because something is said in a published book or in a big forum does not necessarily mean it's true or that's reality. A basic description of this book is that it is 17 chapters with redefined words of a spectrum of different forms of racism mixed with anecdote and memoir from Kendi's life and intermingled with personal philosophy and social slash political policy. We're going to get into some of the redefinitions in segments ahead, and this is just Kendi sharing his perspective on what reality is. So with that, with all of that said, <laughs> get a drink, grab a drink. So with all that said, <laughs> grab a drink, get comfy, and let's get started. But it wasn't just my clothes that didn't fit the scene. My competitors were academic prodigies. I wasn't. I carried a GPA lower than 3.0, my SAT score barely cracked 1,000. Colleges were recruiting my competitors. I was riding the high of having received surprise admission letters from the two colleges I half-heartedly applied to. And embarrassing me before what we could call the white judge. Classic dad. He couldn't care less what judgmental white people thought about him. He rarely, if ever, put on a happy mask, faked a calm voice, hid his opinion, or avoided making a scene. I loved and hated my father for living on his own terms in a world that usually denies black people their own terms. It was the sort of defiance that could have gotten him lynched by a mob in a different time and place or lynched by men in badges today. I thought I was stupid, too dumb for college. Of course, intelligence is as subjective as beauty. Racist ideas make people of color think less of themselves, which makes them more vulnerable to racist ideas. Racist ideas make white people think more of themselves, which further attracts them to racist ideas. They think it's okay not to think, I charged, raising the classic racist idea that black youth don't value education as much as their non-black counterparts. No one seems to care that this well-traveled idea had flown on anecdotes, but had never been grounded in proof. I finished high school in the year 2000 touting so many racist ideas, 
A racist culture had handed me the ammunition to shoot black people, to shoot myself, and I took it and used it. Internalized racism is the real black on black crime. The language used by the 45th president of the United States offers a clear example of how this sort of racist language and thinking works. Long before he became president, Donald Trump liked to say, quote, laziness is the trait of blacks, unquote. When he decided to run for president, his plan for making America great again, defaming Latinx immigrants as mostly criminals and rapists, and demanding billions for a border wall to block them. He promised a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Once he became president, he routinely called his black critics stupid. He claimed immigrants from Haiti all have AIDS, while praising white supremacists as a very fine people in the summer of 2017. This is one of the few places where I would more assume that it is um, malice and not ignorance because of the misrepresentation of everything here. And again, the very fine people hoax, but that's all I'm gonna say interrupt in it as an interruption right here. When racist policies resound, denials that those policies are racist also follow. Racist isn't a descriptive word, it's a pejorative word. It is the equivalent of saying, I don't like you. These are a the actual words of white supremacists Richard Spencer, who, like Trump's, identifies as not racist. How many of us who despise the Trumps and white supremacists of the world share their self-definitions of not racist? What's the problem with being not racist? It is a claim that signifies neutrality. Quote, I am not a racist, but neither am I aggressively against racism. The claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism. The common idea of claiming colorblindness is akin to the notion of being not racist. As with the not racist, the colorblind individual, by ostensibly failing to see race, fails to see racism and falls into racist passivity. We can be a racist one minute and an anti-racist the next. What we say about race, what we do about race, in each moment determines what, not who, we are. I am no longer policing my every action around an imagined white or black judge trying to convince white people of my equal humanity, trying to convince black people I am re representing the race well. After taking this grueling journey to the dirt road of anti-racism, humanity can come upon the clearing of a potential failure, an anti-racist world in all its imperfect beauty. It can become real. It can become real if we focus on power instead of people, if we focus on changing policy instead of groups of people. It's possible if we overcome our cynicism about the permanence of racism. A former gang member and a son of a Baptist preacher, he reached thousands via his weekly radio show and tours where he delivered sermons at packed iconic venues like the Apollo Theater in his native Harlem. In 1970, Skinner published his third and fourth books, How Black is the Gospel and Words of Revolution. The Black Aesthetic, a class taught by legendary Baruch College literary scholar Addison Gale Jr. For the first time, Larry, who is Kendi's father, read James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, Richard Wright's Native Son, Amiri Baraka's Wrenching Plays, and the banned Revolutionary Manifesto, The Spook Who Sat by the Door by Sam Greenlee. That's a sat satirical novel, by the way, if you look it up. It was an awakening. After Gale's class, Larry started searching for a way to reconcile his faith with his newfound Black consciousness. That search led him to Tom Skinner. Dad returned to his church and quit its famed youth choir. He began organizing programs that asked provocative questions. Is Christianity the white man's religion? Is black? Is the black church relevant to the black community? He began reading the works of James Cone, the scholarly father of black liberation theology and author of the influential black theology and black power in 1969. After class, Dad approached the professor. What is your definition of a Christian? Dad asked in his deeply earnest way. Cone looked at Dad with equal seriousness and responded, A Christian is one who is striving for liberation. James Cone's working definition of a Christian described a Christianity of the enslaved, not a Christianity of the slaveholders. Receiving this definition was a revolutionary moment in Dad's life. 
Ma had her own similar revelation in her Black Student Union that Christianity was about the struggle and liberation. My parents now had, separately, arrived at the creed with which to shape their lives, to be the type of Christians that Jesus, the revolutionary, inspired them to be, this new definition of a word that they'd already chosen as their core identity naturally transformed them. And the key act for both of us was defining our terms so that we could begin to describe the world and our place in it. Definitions anchor us in principles. This is not a light point. If we don't do the basic work of defining the kinds of people we want to be in language that is stable and consistent, we can't work toward stable, consistent goals. Some of my most consequential steps towards being an anti-racist have been the moments when I arrived at basic definitions. To be an anti-racist is to set lucid definitions of racism and anti-racism, racist and anti-racist policies, racist and anti-racist ideas, racist and anti-racist people. To, to be a racist is to constantly redefine racist in a way that exonerates one's changing policies, ideas, and personhood. What is racism? Racism is the marriage of racist people and racist ideas that produce and normalize racial inequities. Racism is racist. True story. Racist inequities is when two or more racial groups are not standing on approximately equal footing. Here are examples of racial inequities. 71% of white families lived in owner-occupied homes in 2014, compared to 45% of Latinx families and 51% of black families. Racial, inequity, er, racial equity is when two or more racial groups are standing on a relatively equal footing. An example of racial equity would be if there were relatively equitable percentages of all three racial groups living in owner-occupied homes in the 40s, 70s, or better, 90s. A racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial inequity between racial groups. An anti-racist policy is any measure that produces or sustains racial equity between racial groups. By policy, I mean written and unwritten laws, rules, procedures, processes, regulations, and guidelines that govern people. There is no such thing as a non-racist or race-neutral policy. Every policy in every institution, in every community, in every nation is producing or sustaining either racial inequity or equity between racial groups. Racist policies have been described by other terms, institutional racism, structural racism, and systemic racism, for instance. But those are vaguer terms than racist policy. When I use them, I find myself having to immediately explain what I mean. Racist policy is more tangible and enacting, and more likely to be immediately understood by people, including its victims. Racial discrimination is an immediate and visible manifestation of an underlying racial policy. Since the 1960s, racist power has commandeered the term racial discrimination, transforming the act of discriminating on the basis of race into an inherently racist act. But if racial discrimination is defined as treating, considering, or making a distinction in favor or against an individual based on that person's race, then racial discrimination is not inherently racist. The defining question is whether the discrimination is creating equity or inequity. If discrimination is creating equity, then it is anti-racist. If discrimination is creating inequity, it is racist. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. As U.S. Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackmun wrote in 1978, in order to get beyond racism, we must first take account of race. There is no other way, and in order to treat some persons equally, we must treat them differently. The most threatening racist movement is not the alt-right's unlikely drive for a white ethnostate, but the regular American's drive for the race-neutral one. The construct of race neutrality actually feeds white nationalist victimhood by posing the notion that any policy protecting or advancing non-white Americans toward equity is reverse discrimination. There may be no more consequential white privilege than life itself. White lives matter to the tune of 3.5 additional years over black lives in the United States, which is just the most glaring of a host of health disparities, starting from infancy where black infants die at twice the rate of white infants. But at least my grandmothers and I met, we shared, we loved. 
I never met my paternal grandfather. I never met my maternal grandfather, Alvin, killed by cancer three years before my birth. In the United States, African Americans are 25% more likely to die of cancer than whites. My father survived prostate cancer, which kills twice as many black men as it does white men. Breast cancer disproportionately kills black women. Racist and anti-racist are like peelable name tags that are placed and replaced based on what someone is doing or not doing, supporting or expressing in each moment. These are not permanent tattoos. No one becomes a racist or an anti-racist. We only strive to be one or the other. We can knowingly strive to be racist. We can knowingly strive to be an anti-racist. Like fighting an addiction, being an anti-racist requires persistent self-awareness, constant self-criticism, and regular self-examination. President Reagan declared war on her unborn baby. Quote, we must put drug abuse on the run through stronger law enforcement, Reagan said in the Rose Garden. It wasn't drug abuse that was put on the run, of course, but people like me, born into a regime of stronger law enforcement. In 2016, Black and Latino... In 2016, Black and Latinx people were still grossly overrepresented in the prison population at 56%, double their percentage of the U.S. population. White people were still grossly underrepresented in the prison population at 30%, about half their percentage of U.S. population. Reagan didn't start this so-called war, as historian Elizabeth Hinton re recounts. President Lyndon B. Johnson first put us on the run when he named 1965 the year when this country began a thorough, intelligent, and effective war on crime. My parents were in high school when Johnson's war on crime mocked his under-supported war on poverty, like a heavily armed shooter mocking the under-resourced trauma surgeon. President Richard Nixon announced his war on drugs in 1971 to devastate his harshest critics, black and anti-war activists. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news, Nixon's domestic policy chief, John Ehrlichman, told a Harper's, a Harper's reporter years later. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Black people joined in the vilification, convinced that homicidal drug dealers, gun toters, and thieving heroin addicts were flushing down the drain all the hard-won gains of the civil rights movement, to quote an editorial in Washington Afro-American in 1981. Some, if not most, black leaders, in an effort to appear as survivors of the people against the menace, turned around and set the black criminal alongside the white racist as the enemies of the people. Both of my parents emerged from poor families, one from northern urban projects, one from southern rural fields. Both framed their rise from poverty into the middle class in the 1980s as a climb up the ladder of education and hard work. As they climbed, they were inundated with racist talking points about black people refusing to climb, the ones who were irresponsibly strung out on heroin or crack, who enjoyed stealing or and being criminally dependent on the hard-earned money of climbing Americans like them. In 1985, adored civil rights lawyer Eleanor Holmes Norton took to New York Times to claim the remedy is not as simple as providing necessities and opportunities, as anti-racists argued. She urged that the overthrow of the complicated predatory ghetto subculture. She called on people like my parents with ghetto origins to save ghetto males and women by impressing on them the values of hard work, education, respect for the family, and achieving a better life for one's children. Norton provided no empirical evidence to substantiate her position that certain ghetto blacks were deficient in any of these values. The Reagan revolution was just that, a radical revolution for the benefit of the already powerful and further enriched high-income Americans by it, for, or it further enriched high-income Americans by cutting their taxes and government regulations, installing a Christmas tree military budget and arresting the power of unions. 70% of middle-income blacks said they saw a great deal of racial discrimination in 1979 before Reagan revolutionaries rolled back enforcement of civil rights laws and affirmative action regulations, before they rolled back funding of state and local governments whose contracts and jobs had become safe avenues into the single-family urban homes of the black middle class. In the same month that Reagan announced this war on drugs on Ma's birthday in 1982, he cut the safety net of federal welfare programs and Medicaid, sending more 
more low-income blacks into poverty. His stronger law enforcement sent more black people into the clutches of violent cops who killed 22 black people for every white person in the early 1980s. Black youth were four times more likely to be unemployed in 1985 than in 1954, but few connected the increase in unemployment to the increase in the violent crime. Deep down, my parents were still the people they were who set on fire who Deep down, my parents were still the people who were set on fire by liberation theology back in Urbana. Ma still dreamed of globetrotting the black world as a liberating missionary, a dream her Liberian friend encouraged in 1974. Dad dreamed of writing liberating poetry, a dream Professor Addison Gale encouraged in 1971. I always wondered what would have been if my parents had not let their reasonable fears stop them from pursuing their dreams. Traveling Ma helping to free the black world, Dad accompanying her and finding inspiration for his freedom poetry. Instead, Ma settled for a corporate career in healthcare technology. Dad settled for an accounting career. They entered the American middle class, a space then as now defined by its dis disproportionate white majority. This conceptual double reflected that Webb Du Bois indelibly voiced in the souls of black folk in 1903. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of ways looking at one's self through the eyes of others. Du Bois wrote, he would neither Africanize America nor bleach the Negro soul in a flood of white Americanism. Du Bois wished to be both a Negro and an American. Du Bois wished to inhabit opposing constructs. To be a, an American is to be white, and to be white is not to be a Negro. Assimilationist ideas are racist ideas. Assimilationists can position any racial group as superior standard that another r racial group should be measuring themselves against, that benchmark that they should be trying to reach. This program of black people feeding black people embodied the gospel of black self-reliance that the adults in my life were feeding me. Black self-reliance was a double-edged sword. One side was an abhorrence of white supremacy and white paternalism, white rulers and white saviors. On the other side, a love of black rulers and black saviors of black paternalism. Assimilationist ideas and segregationist ideas are two types of racist ideas, the duel within the racist thought. David Hume declared that all races are created unequal, but Thomas Jefferson seemed to disagree in 1976 when he declared all men were created equal, but Thomas Jefferson never made the anti-racist declaration, all racial groups are equal. But there is a way to get free. To be anti-racist is to emancipate oneself from the dueling consciousness. To be anti-racist is to conquer the assimilationist consciousness and the segregationist consciousness. The white body is no longer present itself as the American body. The black body is no longer striving to be the American body. Knowing there is no such thing as the American body, only American bodies radicalized by power. In that classroom on that April day in 1990, my parents discovered that I had entered racial puberty. At seven years old, I began to feel the encroaching fog of racism overtaking my dark body. It felt big, bigger than me, bigger than my parents, and anything in my world and threatening. What a powerful construction race is. Powerful enough to consume us. And it comes for us early. So I do not pity my seven-year-old self for identifying racially as black. I still identify as black. Not because I believe blackness or race is a meaningful scientific category, but because our societies, our policies, our ideas, our histories, and our culture have rendered race and made it matter. Some white people do not identify as white for the same reason they identify as not racist, to avoid reckoning with the ways that whiteness, even as a construction and mirage, has informed their notions of America and identity and offered them privilege. The primary one being the privilege of being inherently normal, standard, and legal. The first global power to construct race happened to be the first racist power and the first exclusive slave trader of the constructed race of African people. The individual who orchestrated this trading of an invented people was nicknamed the Navigator, though he did not leave Portugal in the 15th century. The only thing he navigated was Europe's political economic seas in order to create the first transatlantic slave trading policy. Hailed for every, hailed for something he was not and ignored for what he was, it is fitting that Prince Henry, the navigator and the brother and then uncle of Portuguese kings, is the first character in history of racist power.
Until his death in 1460, Prince Henry sponsored Atlantic voyage to West Africa by the Portuguese to circumvent Islamic slave trade and in doing so created a different sort of slavery than had existed before. Pre-modern Islamic slave traders like their Christian counterparts in pre-modern Italy were not pursuing racist policies. They were enslaving what they now consider to be Africans, Arabs, and Europeans alike. At the dawn of the modern world, the Portuguese began to exclusively trade African bodies. Prince Henry's sailors made history when they navigated past the feared black hole of Cape bah Bahador off western Sahara and brought enslaved Africans back to Portugal. One of Zurara's stories chronicled Prince Henry's first major slave auction in Lagos, Portugal in 1444. Some captives were white enough, fair to look upon, and well-proportioned, while the others were like mulattoes or as black as Ethiopes, and so ugly. Despite their different skin colors and language and ethnic groups, Zurara blended them into one single group of people worthy of enslavement. I cannot recall her name, so very odd. I can recite the names of my black 4th, 5th, and 6th grade teachers, but the name of my white 3rd grade teacher is lost in my memory, like the names of so many racist white people over the years who interrupted my peace with their sirens. Forgetting her may have been my coping mechanism. People of color sometimes cope with abuse from individual whites by hiding those individuals behind the generalized banner of whiteness. She acted that way, we say, because she was white. I do not use microaggressions anymore. I detest the post-racial platform that supported its sudden popularity. I detest its component parts, micro and aggression. A persistent daily low hum of racist abuse is not minor. I use the term abuse because aggression is not as exacting a term. Abuse accurately describes the actions and its effect on people, distress, anger, worry, depression, anxiety, pain, fatigue, and suicide. What other people call racial microaggressions, I call racist abuse. And I call the zero tolerance policy preventing and punishing these abusers what they are, anti-racist. Ibram, time to go, she said pleasantly. I'm not going anywhere, I faintly replied, and I looked straight ahead at the cross. What? I looked up at her, eyes wide and burning. I'm not going anywhere. No, you need to leave right now. Looking back, I wonder if I'd been one of her white kids, would she have asked me, what's wrong? Would she have wondered if I was hurting? I wonder. I wonder if her racist ideas chalked up my resistance to my blackness and therefore categorized it as misbehavior, not distress. With racist teachers, misbehaving kids of color do not receive inquiry and empathy and legitimacy. We receive orders and punishment and no excuses as if we are adults. The black child is ill-treated like an adult, and the black adult is ill-treated like a child. My classmates were nearly out of the chapel, an observant handful stopped near the door, gazing and speculating. Irate and perplexed at this disruption, the teacher tried again to command me. She failed again. She grabbed my shoulder. Don't touch me, I yelled. I'm calling the principal, she said, turning toward the exit. I don't care. Call her. Call her right now, I shouted, looking straight ahead as she walked away behind me. I felt a single tear falling down each eye. It also conflicted with the secular creed I've been taught, the American creation story that all men are created equal. Singular race makers pushed for the end of categorizing and identifying by race. They wagged their fingers at people like me identifying as black, but the unfortunate truth is that their well-meaning post-racial strategy makes no sense in our racist world. Race is a mirage, but one that humanity has organized itself around in very real ways. Assimilationists believe in a post-racial myth that talking about race constitutes racism, or that if we stop identifying by race, then racism will miraculously go away. They fail to realize that if we stop using racial categories, then we will not be able to identify racial inequity. If we cannot identify racial inequity, then we will not be able to identify racist policies. If we cannot identify racist policies, then we cannot challenge racist policies. If we cannot challenge racist policies, then racist power's final solution will be achieved. A world of inequity none of us can see, let alone resist. Terminating racial categories is potentially the last, not the first, step in the anti-racist struggle. To be anti-racist is to recognize that there is no such thing as white blood or black disease or natural Latinx athleticism. 
To be an anti-racist is to also recognize the living, breathing reality of this racial mirage. The principal finally sat down next to me. Maybe she suddenly saw me not as this misbehaving black boy, but as a boy, a student, under, the care, under her care with a problem. Maybe not. In any case, I was allowed to speak. I defended my dissertation. I did not use the terms like racist abuse or racist ideas. I used terms like fair and unfair, sad and happy. She listened and surprised me with questions. My one boy sit-in ended after she heard me out and agreed to talk to that teacher. Back in the classroom, amid the hugging happiness, I glanced over at my white 8th grade teacher. Her face, her red face shook as she held back tears, maybe feeling the same overwhelming sensation of hopelessness and discouragement that black people feel all too many times. I smiled at her. I didn't really care. I wanted OJ to run free. I had been listening to what the black adults around me had been lecturing about for months in 1995. They did not think OJ was innocent of murder any more than they thought that he was innocent of selling out his people, but they knew the criminal justice system was guilty too. There were no winners in 8th grade either. In class, I'd randomly shout, Ref! A friend would scream you, and another friend would scream G, and the whole class of African Americans would burst out laughing as the three of us pointed at Kwame and chanted, Refugee, refugee, refugee. The smiling white teacher would tell us to be quiet. Kwam, Kwame, would break the quietness with defensive jokes. The cycle would repeat day after day. Nah, yo, I coolly responded to Smurf's questions about my fear. My eyes locked on the gun. Whatever, man, he snickered. You scared, yo. Then he jammed the gun in my ribs and offered a hard smile. What could happen based on my deepest fears mattered more than what did happen to me. I believed violence was stalking me, but in truth, I was being stalked inside my own head by racist ideas. More than the times I risked jail, I am still haunted by the times I did not help the victims of violence. My refusal to help them jailed me in fear. I was scared of the black body as the white body was scared of me. I could not muster the strength to do right. Like that time one another packed bus after school, a small Indian teen, tinier than me, sat near me at the back of the bus that day. My seat faced the back door and the Indian sat in the single seat next, right next to the back door. I kept staring at him, trying to catch his eyes so that I could give him a nod that would direct him to the front of the bus. I saw other black and Indian kids on the bus trying to do the same with their eyes. We wanted so badly for him to move, but he was fixated on whatever was playing on his fresh new Walkman. His eyes were closed and his head bobbed. Yo bro, run the Walkman. Smurf said rather gently. The kid did not look up, still captivated by the beat coming from his headphones. Smurf punch tapped him on the shoulder. Yo, bro, run the Walkman, he shouted. I wanted to stand up and yell, leave that bro alone. Why are you always fucking with people, Smurf? What the fuck is wrong with you? But my fears caged me. I remained seated and quiet. The kid finally looked up startled. What? The shock of Smurf looming over him and the loudness of the music made him raise his voice. I shook my head, but without shaking my head, I remained still. In 1993, a bipartisan group of white legislators introduced the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. They were thinking about Smurf and me. But crime bills have never correlated to crime any more than fear has correlated to actual violence. We are not meant to fear suits with policies that kill. We are not meant to fear good white males with AR-15s. No, we are to fear the weary, unarmed Latinx body from Latin America. The Arab body kneeling to Allah is to be feared. The black body from hell is to be feared. Adept politicians and crime entrepreneurs manufacture the fear and stand before voters to deliver them. Messiahs who will liberate them from the fear of those other bodies. We scared them just the same. All they saw were our dangerous black bodies. Cops seemed especially fearful. Just as I learned to avoid smurfs of the world, I learned to keep racist police officers from getting nervous. Black people are apparently responsible for cal calming the fears of violent cops in the way that women are supposedly responsible for calming the sexual desires of male rapists. Run that fucking Walkman, Smurf yelled, now turning his head to the front of the bus and most likely prompting the bus driver to call the ruckus in. The shocked teen started to stand up, saying nothing, just shaking his head. He probably intended to relocate to the front near the relative safety of the bus driver. But as soon as his but as soon as he straightened his body, Smurf landed a side haymaker to the kid's temple. His head bounced into the window and then into the bus floor. Smurf snatched the tumbling walkman and then the boys got up and joined in. The kid covered his face when the stomps from Timberland's boots came pummeling down. It all happened right in front of me, and I did nothing. I did nothing. 
The acts of violence I saw from Smurf and others combined with the racist ideas all around me to convince me that more violence lurked than there actually was. I believed that violence didn't define just Smurf, but all the black people around me, my school and my neighborhood. I do not remember a single teacher or class or lesson or assignment from ninth grade. I was checked out. I attended John Brown like someone who clocked into his job with no intention of working. I only worked hard on my first love. I had neither loved nor hated middle school, but a few months in, high school had changed me. I can't pinpoint what triggered my hatred of school. My to be anti-racist is to reject cultural standards and level cultural differences. Civilization is often a polite euphemism for cultural racism. Hip-hop has had the most sophisticated vocabulary of any American musical genre. At the same time, though, as an urban black northerner, I looked down on the cultures of non-urban blacks, especially southerners, the very people I was now surrounded by. I measured their beloved go-go music, then popular in D.C. and Virginia, against what I consider to be the gold standard of black music. Queen's hip-hop and despised it like C. Dolores Tucker despised hip-hop. The guys in Virginia could not dress. I hated their abonics. I thought the basketball players were scrubs who I had to patronize, a belief that cost me the spot of the JV squad. I walked around during those early months at Stonewall Jackson with an unspoken arrogance. I suspect potential friends heard my nonverbal cues of snobbery and rightly stayed away. Whoever creates a cultural standard usually puts themselves at the top of the hierarchy. All cultures must be judged in relation to their own history, and all individuals and groups in relation to their cultural history, and definitely not by arbitrary standards of any single culture, wrote Ashley Montague in 1942, a clear expression of cultural relativity, the essence of cultural anti-racism. To be anti-racist is to see all cultures and all their differences as one and the same level, as equals. Indeed, I was irresponsible in high school. It makes anti-racist sense to talk about the personal irresponsibility of individuals like me of all races. I screwed up. I could have studied harder, but some of my white friends could have studied harder too, and their families and irresponsibilities didn't somehow tarnish their race. My problem with personal responsibility, my problems with personal responsibility were exacerbated or perhaps even caused by the additional struggle that racism added to my school life. From a history of disinterested racist teachers to overcrowded schools to the daily racist attacks that fought that fell on young black boys and girls. One of racism's harms is the way that it falls on the unexceptional black person who is asked to be extraordinary just to survive. Or even worse, the black screw-up who faces the abyss after one error while the white screw-up is handed second chances and empathy. This shouldn't be surprising. One of the fundamental values of racism to white people is that it makes successful attainments is that it makes success attainable for even unexceptional whites, while success, even moderate success, is usually reserved for extraordinary black people. It makes racist sense to talk about personal irresponsibility as it applies to an entire group. Racial group behavior is a figment of a racist imagination. Making individuals responsible for the, for the perceived behaviors of racial groups and making whole racial groups responsible for the behaviors of individuals are the two ways that behavioral racism infects our perceptions of the world. Black individuals have, of course, suffered trauma from slavery and ongoing oppression. Some individuals throughout history have exhibited negative behaviors related to this trauma. De Gruy is a hero for ushering the constructs of trauma, damage, and healing into our understanding of black life. But there is a thin line between an anti-racist saying individual blacks have suffered trauma and a racist saying blacks are a traumatized people. I felt suffocated by a sense of being judged, primarily by people I was closest to, other black people, particularly older black people, who worried over my entire generation. My parents nudged me into international baccalaureate classes, and even though I didn't have particularly high expectations for myself, I went along with it. I entered a, the sanctimonious world of IB, surrounded by a sea of white and Asian students. This environment only made my hatred for school more intense, if now for a different reason. I felt stranded, save for an occasional class with my friend Maya, a black teen preparing for Spelman College. None of my white or Asian classmates came to save me. Rarely opening my lips or raising my hands, I shaped myself according to what I thought they believed about me. I felt like a person in a leaky boat as they sailed by me every day on their way to standardized test prep sessions, Ivy League dreams and competitions for teachers' praises. I saw myself through their eyes, an imposter deserving of invisibility. 
I internalized my academic struggle as indicative of something wrong, not just with my behavior, but with black behavior as a whole, since I represented the race both in their eyes, or what I thought I saw in their eyes, and in my own. The so-called attribution effect, which drives us to take personal credit for any success. Whenever the anti-racist sees individuals behaving positively or negatively, the anti-racist sees exactly that, individuals behaving positively or negatively, not representatives of whole groups. The first woman I dated at FAMU was lighter than me, with almost caramel-colored skin. Straight hair fell down her petite body. I liked her, or did I like that she liked me? But I did not like how my friends fawned over her and overlooked her darker roommate and best friend. The more my friends ignored or denigrated the dark woman, the more I resented myself for liking the light woman. After a few months, I had enough. I abruptly cut off the light woman. My friends thought that I had lost my mind. To this day, they deem the light woman the prettiest woman I dated at FAMU. After her, they say I rolled downhill into the dark abyss. And they're right about the darkness, if not the abyss. That first light college girlfriend ended up being the last at FAMU. I pledged to date only dark women. Only my light friend, Terrell, did not think that I had lost my mind. He preferred dark women too. I looked down on the rest, anyone who did not prefer dark women as well. I hardly realized my own racist hypocrisy. I was turning the color hierarchy upside down, but the color hierarchy remained. But that but the color hierarchy remained. Dark people degraded and alienated light people with names light bright high yellow red bone you're never black enough a light woman once told oprah about her feelings of rejection light people constantly report their struggle to integrate with the dark people to prove their blackness to dark people and if as if dark people are the judges and standards of blackness the irony is that many dark people read me circa 2000 do think of themselves as the judges and standard of blackness while at the same time meekly aspiring to be the standard of lightness or whiteness. Spike Lee satirized his experiences in the late 1970s at historically black Morehouse College as a battle between the dark-skinned Jigaboos and the light-skinned Wannabes. We hunted out those thousands of FAMU students who did not vote. We shamed those non-voters with stories of people who marched so that we could vote. As Bush's team transitioned that winter, I transitioned to hating white people. But racist ideas also suppress the resistance to policies that are detrimental to white people by convincing the average white people that inequity is rooted in personal failure and is unrelated to policy. I was looking for a biological theory of why white people are evil. The global white minority's profound sense of numerical inadequacies and color inferiority causes their uncontrollable sense of hostility and aggression, Welsing wrote. White people are defending against their own genetic annihilation. Melanin packing a color always annihilates the non-color white. They're aliens, I told Clarence. Confidently resting on the doorframe, arms crossed, I just saw this documentary that laid out the evidence. That's why they are so intent on white supremacy. That's why they seem not to have a conscience. They are aliens. I'm dead serious. This explains slavery and colonization. This explains why the Bush family is so evil. This explains why whites don't give a damn. This explains why they hate us so damn much. They're aliens. I learned that in that office that day, that every time I say something is wrong with black people, I am simultaneously separating myself from them, essentially saying, those guys. When I do this, I'm being a racist. I keep using the term anti-capitalist as opposed to socialist or communist to include the people who publicly or privately question or loathe capitalism, but do not identify as socialist or communist. I use capitalist because conservative defenders of capitalism regularly say their liberal and socialist opponents are against capitalism. They say efforts to provide a safety net for people are anti-capitalist. They say that attempts to prevent monopolies are anti-capitalist. They say efforts that strengthen weak unions and weakened exploitive owners are anti-capitalist. They say plans to normalize worker ownership and regulations protecting consumers, workers, and environments from big business are anti-capitalist. They say laws taxing the rich more than the middle class, redistributing pilfered wealth and guaranteeing basic incomes are anti-capitalist. They say wars to end poverty are anti-capitalist. They say campaigns to remove the profit motive from essential life sectors like education, healthcare, utilities, mass media, and incarceration are anti-capitalist. 
In doing so, these conservative defenders are defining capitalism. They define capitalism as the freedom to exploit people into economic ruin, the freedom to assassinate unions, unions the freedom to prey on unprotected consumers, workers, and environments, the freedom to value quarterly profits over climate change, the freedom to undermine small businesses and cushion corporations, the freedom from competition, the freedom not to pay taxes, the freedom to heave the tax burden onto the middle class, and lower class, the freedom to commodify everything and everyone, the freedom to keep poor people poor and middle, middle income people struggling to stay in middle income and make rich people richer, the history of capitalism, of world warring, classing, slave trading, enslaving, colonizing, depressing wages, and dispossessing land and labor and resources and rights bears out the conservative definition of capitalism. I've considered poor blacks to be the truest and most authentic representations of black people. While others fled from poor blacks and racist fear of their dangerous inferiority, I was fleeing to poor blacks and racist assurance of the superiority conferred by their danger, their superior, uh, their, su their superior authenticity. Frazier dubbed black elites as inferior, as quicker racial sellouts, as bigger conspicuous consumers, as more politically corrupt, as more exploitive, as more irrational for looking up to the very people oppressing them. This inverted class racism about inferior black elites quickly became a religious belief. We called our African American study space a black space. It was, after all, governed primarily by black bodies, black thought, black culture, and black history. Of course, the spaces at Temple University, governed by primarily at, by white bodies, white thought, white culture, and white histories, were not labeled white. They hid the whiteness of their spaces behind the veil of color blindness. In my first course with Mazama, she lectured of on Asante's contention that objectivity was really collective subjectivity. She concluded, it is impossible to be objective. Racist Americans stigmatized entire black neighborhoods as places of homicide and mortal violence, but don't similarly connect white neighborhoods to the disproportionate number of white males who engage in mass shootings. The racial wealth gap produces a giving gap. For public HBCUs, the giving gap extends to state funding gap. As racist policies steer more funds to HWCUs like the current performance-based state models. The integrationist strategy, the placing of white and non-white bodies in the same spaces, is thought to cultivate away the barbarianism of people of color and the racism of white people. The integrationist strategy expects black bodies to heal in proximity to whites who haven't yet stopped fighting them. After enduring slavery's violence, Frazier and his brethren had enough. They desired to separate, not from whites, but from white racism. Separation is not always segregation. The anti-racist desire to separate from racists is different from the segregationist desire to separate from the inferior blacks. Sexist notions of men as more naturally dangerous than women, since women are considered naturally fragile in need of protection. To be queer anti-racist is to see the new wave of both religious freedom laws and voter ID laws in Republican states as taking away the rights of queer people. The judges strap the entire black race on the black body's back, shove the burdened black body into white spaces, order the burdened black body to always act in an upstanding manner to persuade away white racism, and punish poor black conduct with sentences of shame for reinforcing racism, for bringing the race down. I felt the burden of my black life to be perfect before both white people and black people judging whether I was representing the race well. The judge never let me just be. Be myself. Be my imperfect self. Upwardly mobile black people deflecting responsibility for changing racist policies by imagining they are uplifting the race by uplifting themselves. The near impossibility of perfectly executing uplift suasion since black people are humanly imperfect. I'm going to give you a moment to think about what exactly that means. It's sort of implying that he thinks white people are perfect and that's why they can have upward mobility. But I don't care. We are already in prison. That's what America means. Prison. What if we measure the radicalism of speech by how radically it transforms open-minded people? By how the speech liberates the anti-racist power within? What if, the me what if we measure the conservatism, conservatism of speech by how intensively it keeps people the same, keeps people enslaved by their racist ideas and fears conserving their inequitable society? Only one person living knows exactly what happened next. Zimmerman, probably, fighting to apprehend the criminal. 
But how could I stare? But how could I worry about my body as I stared at police officers butchering the black body almost every week on my cell phone? There is nothing that I see in our world today, in our history, giving me hope that one day anti-racists will win the fight. That one day the flag of anti-racism will fly over the world of inequity. So there's a lot to go through with all of the segments and even many segments that I didn't add to this video because it would it would be it would be a long time. But the few things that I want to say that I didn't interject throughout the reading is um, some of these. First, my impression is that Kendi is a racist, and he's always been a racist. He he targeted the Indian kid. He recognized the Indian kid. He talked about how he hated white people. He talked about how he assumed what other people thought of him based on his race. He said, I'm seeing myself through the way that I think they're looking at me. So it's not even what they've said or what they've done. It's what he thinks other people of him. It seems like a low self-esteem, low self-esteem kind of argument and racism on his own. He quotes FDR twice in this book, but he can't attribute anything positive to white people. Like even when he mentions Jefferson, he goes, well, Jefferson said all men are equal, but he didn't say all races are equal. I think that's kind of implied in the statement, but he can't give anything positive to white people. Maybe it's pathological. So he says it's an anonymous philosopher. This man has published multiple books. He, this book is from a big publishing house, one of the big five, and He's a university professor. You can search up the quote that he used or the reference he was making and find FDR immediately. But he cannot, for the life of him, offer something kind to say about some white person at some point in history. There is no kindness in this book for whites at all. Which is interesting because he argues you can't punish white people as a group as a whole in this book while also simultaneously punishing white people as a group as a whole in here. Kendi, in my opinion, is crafting reality here, and he makes it obvious when he brings up George Zimmerman by saying only George knows what happened that day, and then goes on to say his version of his story peppered with the word probably. So only this one guy knows, but probably my interpretation is correct. Excuse me? <laughs> of course, it somehow probably happened the way you imagined it, right, Kendi? At the end of the day, this book reads to me like it was supposed to be another cancer-related memoir because there were many instances throughout it that mentioned cancer and black people, and the last chapter specifically has to do with Kendi having cancer and his wife also had cancer, and then he ties racism back into cancer, and so cancer is kind of a big part of this book. But Kendi's agent and Random House and or Random House probably said we can't sell another cancer memoir. Can you do something else with this that's more marketable? So then Kendi wove his memoir with racial politics because that is hot right now and that will sell. And so then he got his memoir plus racial politics plus money. It's a diatribe of a racist and a kind of cultist manual too, if I'm honest with you. Even more so, it reads like a cultist manual and a secular religion when, it, when you consider the following phrase. You cannot be neutral it, to this book. You are either a racist or you're an anti-racist. There is no difference in that than the religious idea that you are either saved or you're a sinner. There's no kind of in-between. One thing that I forgot to mention that might have gotten lost in this book is that um, Kendi seems like he might have been an underachieving jerk when he was growing up. He was checking out of high school, of middle school. He There are parts in there where he threw tantrums about this middle school that he was sent to because he didn't want to go there. He shows that he was uncooperative with teachers. They responded, they responded to that uncooperation with him because he was black, but he was just assuming that's it. Usually schools kind of do that because they need to keep the kids in line and they need to keep the kids going because, you know, you get you get one, you end up with a mutiny. But he assumes that all of the actions against him are because of racism and that people are treated differently because of the race. That is his assumption the whole time through. Well, he also says that he judged people based on their skin color. He changed his eye colors. He, he dated a lighter skinned, non-white person until his friends were showing that they liked her and then he swore off lighter skinned people and would only date darker skinned people. He confessed that he was also an, a judger of who was a true black person circa 2000. He also talked about how his, how he identified with people like Smurf who robbed 
you know, an Indian kid on the bus. He, he talks about how his dad had no problem making a scene and obviously he didn't make a scene either. So maybe the kind of thing that's lost in this is that the world isn't necessarily or society America is not as racist as you kind of think it is, but you're just an asshole. And the responses that you've gotten to yourself are not because people are looking at you for your race. They're looking at you because you have a bad attitude and you don't try to work with people. You're kind of entitled and you kind of force your entitlement on other people. But I'm just one robot. That's just my interpretation. So let me know in the comments down below if you have read this book. If you haven't read this book, still let me know what your thoughts are on the segments that I shared. I am interested in the conversation because what it's been like three weeks two or three weeks since i've read this and even reading over the clips i'm still like what so thank you also for your attention in this probably going to end up longer a video by the time i get done editing it and uh, i appreciate you if you like this kind of content please remember to like share and subscribe for more give me your suggestions of books you would like me to read and kind of analyze and i'll take a look at them until next time thank you so much for joining me and have a good, good Monday and don't die. Dear Madame Astra, That's me. We regret to inform you that on August 1st, your employer, Agatha Jane Benedict, owner of the Benedict estate, peacefully passed away in her sleep. Oh, that's so sad. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Let me try that again. <clears throat> Oh. oh my goodness, that's so sad. Yeah, I think I'm ready. With millions of dollars on the line and the opportunity for your every need to be taken care of for life. <laughs> Tell me, is there anything more valuable than that? I didn't think so. Dead and Drive is a dark comedy novel that makes three promises. One, an illustrious estate in Louisiana. Two, an opulent dinner affair for all in attendance. And three, and most importantly of all, lots and lots of competitive murder. So if you're looking for a cozy book to settle in with for the spooky season, I've only got one question for you. Will I see you at the will reading? <laughs>